hello and welcome back fellow audio enthusiast. This is Two Channel Listening and I am your host Jason. Amazingly enough, it has already been six months to pass since I became the owner of these very behemoth Avalon Acoustic Radian speakers. Now before I can talk about these ginormous monstrosities in a good way, you need to understand something about Avalon Acoustics, where they hail from, when did they get started, and who most importantly started them. It takes a physics major, not an electrical engineer, but a physics major. The very late Charlie Hansen. Yes, the Charlie Hansen that had founded Air Acoustics in Boulder, Colorado. It starts with a partnership with Mr. Charlie Hansen and Neil Patel, both engineers that come to design with a different philosophy, one that has not been widely respected amongst the ultra hi-fi owners. And when I say ultra hi-fi, you'll understand what I mean later on. To be an owner of an Avalon acoustic speaker or a Wilson or a Magico or a Rockport, you are entering a rarefied field. You are entering rarefied amounts of money to be spent. And hence, after six months of my own ownership, with much trepidation, I dip my toe into the ultra hi-fi realm to bring you these Avalon Acoustic Radiance. Nevertheless, Mr. Charlie Hansen started the company in nine, about 1989. And while he was half partner in that endeavor, Avalon Acoustics did capture the ear of another designer, the Mr. Jeff Rowland himself. Now, Jeff Rowland really appreciated how his amplifiers and preamplifiers sounded when mated with the Avalon Acoustic speakers. He loved it so much and thought it was such a great pairing that he decided to buy out Charlie Hansen. Well, that created a bit of a problem for Mr. Jeff Rowland back in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. You see, he already had a well-established network for distribution for Jeff Rowland products. And that dealer network did not appreciate that Jeff was going to now tell people that they had to put Jeff Rowland gear with Avalon acoustic speakers. And so like many adventures, like many adventures, if you don't already have a direct to consumer market, you're going to have a really hard time telling dealers exactly how they can sell your gear and what they can sell your gear with. So not long after that, Jeff Rowland had to sell his, his portion of the company and it ended up being Neil Patel himself that took over full ownership of Avalon Acoustics in the 1990s. Of some notable ownership, I, I do have to mention that even Colleen Cardis, she herself for many years sported the Avalon avatars for her personal listening preference. So there are some folks out there that definitely understood what it was that Avalon Acoustics was trying to do with their very interest, interesting designs. And as I will get into the, the inert cabinets themselves, they have a unique perspective on controlling cabinet resonances. Me, myself, I have told you many a times that growing up with the hi-fi I've been a Zoo Audio fan. Now, until recently, Zoo Audio has always been a brand that has been accessible for those who don't have a lot of coin to spend on speakers. And Zoo Audio is also another one of those brands that they, they take listening first and specifications later as a matter of a, a company mantra. They design their speakers around what you're going to hear, what the expectations that you're going to listen to, and not designing the speaker specifically on specifications only and how well it does in an anechoic chamber. Well, when you move up the echelon into the ultra hi-fi space, that is where Avalon Acoustics come in, and equally, there's an incredible amount of disdain towards this company 
as there are those who love these speakers and would own nothing other than an Avalon Acoustics. So I've learned a lot about, about this brand and the Ultra Hi-Fi along the last six months. Make no mistake, there is an incredible amount of snobbery once you reach this level of Ultra Hi-Fi. I can give you an excellent example. One that if you have the time, I highly recommend you dive into it. 13 page review. I'm going to put a link in the description for you all. Let's go back to 1996, a 13 page review, not by none other than Robert Harley. Setting up for that 13 page review, Neil Patel decided that he was going to link his brand, link Avalon Acoustics with Spectral Audio and the cable maker MIT. Those three companies worked on a collaboration to create a marketing platform that was called 2C3D. And basically it was going around to dealers and saying that they could get the certification to sell an entire two channel package that is based on two channel, three dimensional sound staging. Only if you were to pair Avalon Acoustics Radians, HCs, the high current version, with Spectral Amplifier Preamplifier, with MIT cables, not just any MIT cables, but MIT MA850s, which are tri -wired, a tri-wired network. Those, in 1996 themselves, retailed for $8,000, folks just the cables to connect to your speakers. So, with this, two, with this 2C 3D system, Robert Harley said, okay, come to my house and set this up, gentlemen. And they did. It took three companies to set up this system that ended up totaling $72,000. The only thing that was missing was the Mark Levinson transport system. Well, in 1996, that equates to $130,000 in 2022 money. That's one hell of a review system. I don't know about you, but on a magnitude of times 10, I'm nowhere near that. As life would have it, everything is about timing, being in the right place at the right time, under the right circumstances, from one perspective and under the wrong circumstances for another person's perspective. These radians, I happened to pick up at an estate sale. It was by complete chance. I was invited to go with another one of my audio friends, Dave, and he dragged me along. And there sat in that room were these beautiful speakers. All the other gear had already been bought up. Equally amazing, there happened to be a pair of Class A Delta M600 monoblocks that these speakers were connected to. Those were already bought and those were already bought and scuttled off with the prior day. But of the entire system that was left, it was just these speakers sitting there at that estate sale. I decided to step up to the plate, make my offer, and with much help, I was able to haul these speakers home. So what do we have? The Avalon Acoustic Radian speakers were produced between 1993 and 1997. The reason why the camera is a little further away for this particular review is so that you could get to see what I am sitting next to and just get the scale of these speakers. Now I'm 5'9 and these, are, these speakers are 48 inches tall, they are 12 inches wide from Point to point, they're 19 inches deep. However, because of the sloped nature of the cabinet, from the front corner to the back corner, it actually encompasses a footprint of 22 inches deep. And therefore, given these proper space away from the back wall, does take up a good amount of my listening, my listening space. Speaking of the cabinets, before I can speak about the cabinet build itself, Due to the weight of these speakers, 
there is what I would say a major fatal flaw in how you connect these speakers. These tri-wired speakers have the connection on the bottom. So I actually had to lay these speakers flat on their sides and connect only spades. Well, except only quarter inch spades. I happen to have MIT Matrix 18 speaker cables at the time, but the spade ends on those were too wide. So I ended up having to go to some zoom mission with the quarter inch copper cardist ends. And that is how the, and that is how I have these connected to directly to the mid range with jumpers to the woofers and jumpers to the treble underneath these speakers. And then I would have to lift up these 170 pound speakers, not in total, but each. Each speaker weighs in at 170 pounds, folks. When I opened this cabinet up, looking at the drivers, there are sections of this cabinet where there are seven layers of glued MDF going more than six inches deep. And then there are the cross member chambers and cross sections and cross bracing that go up and down from the top to the bottom in two other sections with additional glued panels of MDF. Then you still have then you still have the wool to contend with. As I pulled that wool out, I found even more dampening products. There was a damping material, some kind of cloth that I could not identify that was glued to each of the flat spaces within the chambers. And I captured a photo of that for you as well. As you could see, I got a light all the way to the back so that I could illuminate all of the multi chambers within this speaker. At 170 pounds and the entire thickness of these speakers, I tell you what, if the Russians ever did decide to invade the United States, I'm just going to push these in front of my windows and hide out behind these. Too soon? No? Yes? Okay, sorry. Anyway, inert. Ow, ow, ow. Oh my gosh. And of all of the speakers that I have reviewed, of all of the speakers that I have owned, 55 pairs of speakers have I owned. I've never even been able to talk about Q factor. These speakers are designed around a Q, quality factor. And quality factor happens to do with resonance. It happens to do with time smearing within the audio spectrum. The higher the Q, that means you have basically something that is under that is under damped. The lower the Q factor, the higher the damping. These have a 0.5 Q factor, which means that it basically cuts any of the resonance as much as possible from going throughout the speaker, from going traveling throughout the speaker, and harming the audio the audio band itself. I've never owned a speaker that actually has a, a known Q factor. Continuing with the design specifications, these speakers are said to operate in an anechoic chamber at 34 Hertz up to 24 K. They operate at an 80 D, 88 dB efficiency. They are rated at four ohms with a 3.6 minimum ohm operation, as well as one interesting smart design is that the grills have the def have the diffraction pads built into them so that you don't have to see that this ugly this ugly quilted material affixed to the front you actually can appreciate the wood in the veneer the veneer quality of the Avalon acoustics but because of the way that these grills are designed these are a speaker that requires you to listen to them with the grill on so that the diffraction pads can do their, do their diligence. When it comes to the playback, I was absolutely intrigued by the Jeff Roland connection. And therefore, with time, I was able to get my hands on 
a Jeff Roland 112 amplifier. Now this 112 is capable of 150 watts at 8 ohms and goes up to 270 watts at 4 ohms. And in total at full power operates at 700 watts. So this is quite a robust it's quite a robust stereo amplifier and I have found that it does match very well with these speakers. So let's talk about what you all want to know. How do they sound? What has my experience been with the Radian speakers given all of the much more budget friendly products that I've lived with? Let me say this. Dipping my toes into the ultra hi-fi realm with this kind of gear has opened my eyes to the fastidiousness, the persnickety setups, the ultra sensitivity to positioning and getting the degrees just right on how these speakers are towed into my listening position. Now, when you get it right, it is very right. It is it is of a magnitude order better than anything I have ever owned, anything that I have listened to with respects of some other amazing systems that I've been able to partake of. But as far as my own system, what I've owned and what I've been able to live with, I have not experienced anything like this ever. Let me tell you about symphonic orchestras. If you love listening to high levels of symphonies. This is your speaker. The weight, the three dimensionality. When putting on Copeland's A Fanfare for a Common Man, you have to crank the amp up as much as it, it can take. And the scale is just, it is, it's beyond immersive. It's beyond impressive. It is beyond just 3D. It is the physical exposure of how your body is absorbing the signals. When the orchestra hits its crescendo and you are feeling the full force of it, it is like you are in the front row looking at the orchestra itself. And it is incredibly addicting. And these speakers are so good at projecting out I was able to move my listening chair and go to the back couch, which is 10 feet further back, bring my wife Amanda out, and then absolutely turn the system up to almost 95% volume. And these speakers just fill this entire room with such sound pressure levels. I didn't think it was possible from two nine inch drivers in a sealed system. Very, very impressive. Now, if you're listening to Holst, if you're listening to Planets, you're listening to Jupiter, you are getting in, you're getting everything you could expect. Now, I'm not going to say it's better than live. I'm not going to say that it's just like live. But I'm going to tell you that in you know typical audiophile speak you really are that much closer to what the real experience is. And I have been blessed to be able to actually attend a few symphonies that played Holst and played Jupiter. And when this thing was cranked up to 95 dB, it's even better because I'm not listening to water bottles getting crinkled, and I'm not listening to snoring, and I'm not listening to the ever-present <coughs> cough. Another, not another notable hi-fi track that I use to test all the speakers is going to be Patricia Barber's Cafe Blue, the track Nardis. I always use this track when it comes to gaining insight into how well does a speaker use its timing, how well does, how well does the bass recover, its speed, and will it smear particularly at minute starting from minute 645 into the track when you get to minute 645 into the track that's where things are really hot 
there's a lot of top hat action, there's a lot of ride symbol action, and the, the bass is going like crazy. Every single time you get to that point, you are gonna you are gonna realize just how well your system is put together and if your speakers can handle the speed, can handle the timing, and keep things cohesive. Most of the speakers that I've personally owned have failed that spot. Either it gets too bright and it gets smeared, or you lose track of the, the baseline, or it just becomes jumbled, or the timing is off, it doesn't sound right, etc., etc., etc. These are the first speakers that I have owned that blew through that test with flying colors. I did not lose track of the timing, I did not lose track of the symbols, and I particularly did not lose track of the bass as it was going in the background. It filled the room, everything stayed concise, and it stayed exactly as it is off to the left with everything that was supposed to be appropriate to the right. And I tell you what, that's how you know you're dealing with something different. Yeah, that's how you know that a build quality of a speaker really does put its money where its mouth is when it comes to resonance control. However, okay. while these speakers excel at symphonic orchestra, they do also excel at jazz. They do also excel at female vocals. If you want to listen to Alison Krauss, if you want to hear an angel in your room, just play Alison Krauss and the three dimensionality of her voice and the intimacy that it brings to the experience is incredible. However, I'm also a hard rock guy. I'm also a heavy metal guy. And here is where my experience goes sideways. Because this, because this level of speaker is so hyper-focused, because there is so little ring, there is no resonance, there is just, it is a finely tuned instrument in of itself, and when you have really good front-end gear, all of a sudden, me, the rocker, when I'm playing some Iron Maiden, and I've got the Trooper going, or I've got the Rime of the Ancient Mariner going, it wasn't as fun. When I got Tool going and I've got it cranked up, it just wasn't the same. There's some flaws in, in I don't want to say harshness, but you actually start to notice some of the timing idiosyncrasies within the bands, and I'm going to go back to Iron Maiden. When listening to the Trooper, and you, you've got two lead guitars that are just wailing away and everything else is going on, you start to notice that there are some time delays within the band members themselves, and I'm talking milliseconds. You actually can hear that much into the recording, and unfortunately you can hear the errors in the recording, and you can hear the harshness of how well it was mastered back in the day. That took away a lot of the fun for me because I got, instead of just rocking away, I started to focus on the actual sound quality. And to me, that became a huge detraction. For a guy who loves heavy metal rock, I have to say that this is where you, you reach that line and it becomes cliche, but gear starts to push you towards listening to specific genres. And now I've, I've really experienced that for myself, that when they talk about only listening to classical or listening to intimate jazz with certain types of gear and certain types of speakers, these fall into that. And that's where my love affair for the Tectons and the Zoo with the large paper drivers comes back full circle for me if I want to listen to heavy metal rock, I'm going to listen to speakers that actually have the guitar drivers built into them because it sounds just like something you're going to hear live. With these speakers, they're so hyper-focused on the details and giving you the imaging and really allowing you to hear into the window of how everything is made. 
it's a double-edged sword. It is, it cuts both ways and I found that it cuts pretty deep. You know, I love Queensryche. So when listening to Operation Mind Crime or more so when going back and forth from Jet City Woman to Silent Lucidity, well, as anybody who knows Silent Lucidity, these speakers cater well to that because it has that, that symphonic feel to it. But when you go back to Jet City Woman and it's more of the, the rock out type of, type of a track, again, it loses, it loses that appeal. It's just, these are not headbanger speakers. And given for me that I still love to augment much of my listening sessions with heavy metal or hard rock, it's hard for me to want to hold on to these speakers for a long time. If I'm only going to come out here to listen to jazz or to listen to acoustical instrumentation or to listen to large symphonies, there's none better. I haven't owned anything that can do better than these. But then I have to go into the other room if I just want to rock out and I want to listen to some Buckethead. That's, I have to say, that's kind of disappointing. And therefore, the return on investment becomes questionable. Now, I failed to mention that in 1993, the base cost of these was $10,500. If you wanted the HC version, which was the high current version, which consequently you were supposed to buy with only the MIT cabling, then these started out at $12,500. If you wanted the specialty veneers, if you wanted the quilted veneers or the knurled, the knurled walnuts or anything of that nature, you had to add $3,500 more to the price. So mine being the base with the veneer upgrade, these, these bad boys ended up costing $14,000 in the mid-1990s. Confession alert. My very first vehicle was a 1994 Ford F-150 standard cab long bed. It retailed or stickered for $13,960 before tax and license. As a 16 year old, I'd still take the truck. That's a different story, isn't it? I will say this about my experience. I'm grateful. I'm happy to be able to, I'm happy that I've been able to own these. They've, they've given me reason to do an, a much deeper dive into an area of hi-fi, ultra hi-fi, that I've never been able to dip my toe into before without going to friends' houses that had much nicer gear than I've been able, been able to own. Yet, I also understand why Avalon Acoustics has the reputation that they do. I understand that why they also have a very poor customer service reputation. And that's going well before COVID, mind you. In the six months I've owned these speakers, I've reached out to Avalon Acoustics on three occasions. I've only received one e email reply in those six months that somebody would be getting back to me they just didn't happen to tell me what year that was going to be. And in my six months of going through the forums, I've seen many international owners that have had issues with these speakers and have not been able to rely on the dealer network, nor have they, have they been given much help from the Boulder, Colorado headquarters. Sorry, shame on you, Avalon Acoustics. Just because people come to you with buckets of money, and those are the only ones that you're going to pay attention to, you've really done yourself a disservice and your brain a disservice. If you don't treat the regular people, if you don't treat your owners well, how do you ever expect your speakers to gain respect on an international level? That's just a little bit of an aside on, on the customer service perspective. So, you know, I know... I'm a nobody when it comes to what I've paid for these speakers. This is a second, this is a second hand, second rate reviewers channel. And I know where I stand in the echelon. However, I feel really bad for those folks out there who have paid the $25,000, who've paid the $59,000, or 
who have paid the $179,000 for the top model. We all only live once, folks. And with that, everybody should try to gain as much experience with as open of a mind as possible. I had no preconceived notions when going into the ownership when I bought these at the, at the estate sale. I just saw a speaker that looked amazing and I thought it must sound amazing because of its size and its weight and its build quality. And in other ways, it's lived up to what a high maintenance ultra luxury product stands for. In wrapping up the review of the Radiant speakers, I once again have to allude to timing. In my own audio journey, I'm wanting to make something of a little bit of a pivot. I want to pivot to start reviewing active speakers. As somebody who works in home automation and works with setting up home theaters, I see a preponderance of Sonos. I see a preponderance of blue sound. I see a preponderance of Bluetooth speakers in general going upscale, just like the Sennheiser Ambios. And then there's the Rubicons. There's the Dolly speakers. I purchased a pair of Rubicon 2C active speakers with the Dolly sound hub. And because I loved my passive Rubicon 2s so much, I was intrigued to see what the active version of those speakers would do as a standalone system that requires nothing but a streaming source. Timing really is everything. The amount of money I paid for that pair of active speakers in that Dolly Sound Hub comes to within $200 of my entire system that I've pieced together over this last year. And the comparisons that are gonna come thereof are incredible. The comparisons and the differences of what that money consists of, of what you can do, really hits home of why I think what I provide you, the viewer, invaluable information on what it means to buy right, buy smart, and to be patient. So if there's anything that's ever gonna be your takeaway from my channel, you do not have to chase new stuff. And I implore you to never buy new unless it's something you know you really wanna live with or you've got the throwaway cash and it really doesn't matter. Everybody needs a job too. So until then, until I come up with those Rubicons, I wish you all a wonderful week. Good luck in your travels. I hope you don't run out of gas. Take care.